Does it say Acts up there? No, it says Galatians. Good, okay. So hopefully I didn't get it wrong on all of my notes, but, you know, you'll know what we're talking about. We are going to be in the book of Acts, but right now we're going to be in the book of Galatians. So today I want us to begin by talking a little bit about the difference. Um, How many of y'all know that in Bible times they wrote a little bit differently than you and I write now? Okay, we, we, we know that. Um, let's say, for example, that <clears throat> um, I'm going to meet uh, an old college uh, friend for dinner tonight at 6 o'clock. And we meet somewhere at Opry Mills, and we have dinner together. And we're so enjoying our conversation that we move our conversation from the restaurant at Opry Mills when it closes to the Waffle House right across the street from uh, what used to be Two Rivers Baptist Church. And and we basically stay there until about 3 o'clock in the morning, just talking and reminiscing. So then I would Monday at some point, I'd say, I had a great time fellowshipping with a friend of mine. I, I spent the evening with that friend. You know, late into the night I spent that. Well, how Paul would have said that was, I spent two days with my friend. Because how they counted time then and how we count time now is a little bit different. If they spend part of today and part of tomorrow, that's two days. I spent two days with them. You say, but but you're only together like six hours. You weren't together 48 hours. But because it was part of this day and was part of that day, it was considered two days. Jesus On the third day arose. Jesus was in the tomb three days. And people do the math. It's like, well, how could he have been in the tomb? He was in the tomb part of one day, all of the next day, and part of the next day. So in New Testament writing, it is three days. Okay? So that should help us a little bit. When we we see time frames and we think, well, now wait a minute. Um, We're about to find out that Paul waited 14 years before he went back to Jerusalem. Well, that may have been 14 years or it may have been... 12 years and two days. If he left on December 31st, got there, spent the entire next year, and then left on January 1st of the next year, he would say, I was there three years. We'd say, no, you were there a year and two days. It's just the way they write. So whenever he writes something about three days or 24 hours or whatever like that, uh, 24 days or or 14 years, uh, we have to understand that our, our way of speaking and his way of speaking are a little bit different there. Why is that important? Well, because there are people who have taken what we're about to read and they say, well, this is really confusing because, wait, you know, I mean, you meant Paul was gone like 14 years and we're, we're going to get to that. Sometimes, however, we, uh, we can get wrapped around little things like that that are just cultural differences, they're writing differences, and they can really kind of mess us up as we try to understand something. So we're going to be in the book of Galatians, um, chapter 2. A couple of things um, this week that I've gotten to do, and and some of you uh, see these things on Facebook. I I made a table for uh, for Leah, and, uh, um, and yes, I got your note about wanting me to make you something, and I might, I might work on that. Uh, I also made a bed for, for Jack, and um, I, have, uh, I have an air gun. All men want to own an air gun. Uh, most of us um, don't own really nice ones. We just own, you know, ones that, you know, grown men would laugh at. But, but, but it works, okay? It still pushes nails through the wood, it still has a cool gun. It makes that pow sound. It's all, it's, it's just all that. Um, <clears throat> so you see, the point of it is not really the size of that gun or the size of the compressor. I have a pancake. It's called a pancake compressor. It's about this big. How many of you men own a can- pancake compressor? How many of you own the really big jumbo? It figures you would do that, John. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> but you see, see the point of it is, it's not the gun or the hose or even the size of the compressor. It's the pressure of the air inside that makes it all work. Guess what? Christians, it's not your exterior that makes you so awesome. It's the pressure of the Holy Spirit inside you that gives you the ability to do far more than you could do on your own. As a matter of fact, he gives you the ability to do incredible things. Jesus says that I give you the ability to do even greater things than I do. Is that because he's 
like made us super special and he's designed us differently. No, it's because of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Christ who lives inside us. He's what drives us. He's what powers us. He's what makes us go. And um, <clears throat> so we're going to be kind of looking at that today. But the other picture that I got, uh, I don't know how many of y'all know what a nail puller is. I bet John knows. John, do you know what a nail puller is? No, no, that's not, kind of, not that kind of nail. Um, a nail puller is, it kind of looks like the, the letter L, and on one end it has a little short set of forks, if you want to call them that, and then the other end it's longer. It's for, like, if you have a nail that's embedded in a piece of wood, you can take that, because it has kind of a sharp edge, and you can hit it on the back, and it'll go under that nail, and it tears up the wood, of course, and then you can pull the nail out. That's a why they call it a nail puller. Imagine that. It's a nail puller. Not a nail biter, a nail puller. And it pulls the nails out. Now, for those of us who have been in an emergency situation and we needed to make a notch in a piece of wood and the only thing we had was a nail puller, most of us have been known to use the wrong tool for the wrong job. Now, it can be done, but it kind of messes things up sometimes because they have these things called wood chisels which are designed to make nice little notches in things and they're usually very sharp and you know you use it and you tap it and you can make these really nice little cuts and all this other stuff and the, the, the vision that God gave me was that in my own personal life and probably in yours, there are times when I'm using a nail puller when he really wants me to use a wood chisel. He wants me to use the right words. He wants me to use the right things. He wants me to use the right tools to accomplish something. Now, I can maybe get something accomplished using the wrong words and the wrong tools and all that other stuff, but I usually make a mess when I do it my way. And, and God is saying, wait, if, you know what? If, you, if, you'll, if you'll use the right tool, the Holy Spirit that is inside you can help you do what you need to do efficiently and much more effectively, but you just have to let me lead. And most of us have a problem with um, wanting to let somebody else lead. Sally and I were dancing at the wedding uh, last weekend, and at one point I looked at her and I said, do you mind if I lead? Because she likes to lead and I'm a horrible dancer, so it, that, that made probably would have been better but the Holy Spirit wants to lead in our life. And when the, we let the Holy Spirit lead in our life, we can do far more things. We can be way more effective. We can be, we, we can be so much better if we let the Holy Spirit lead us. So our only goal at that point is to keep saying yes to him and let me get out of the way. Yes to you and let me get out of the way. That's what living by the Spirit means. Why am I saying all this? Well, number one, because I think it's important and I think I'm not the only person who has a tendency to try to do it on his own. But number two is there, there has crept into the church, there is it today and there was then, there crept into the church this thing about it's about how you act. It's about how you behave. It's about the, if you've got this in your life, okay. If you have this in your life, it's not okay. There, is, there are moral absolutes in the scripture. You read the Bible, there are moral absolutes. There are things that are in the heart of God. There are things that go against the heart of God. We're not, we're not disputing that. What we're disputing is that salvation is never based on anything other than the work of the cross in Jesus Christ. It's not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and this, or believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you've got to get this out of your life. If you need something out of your life, if the Holy Spirit wants something out of your life, if God wants something out of your life, he is happy to help you move that out of your life. But he's not saying, hey, once you, as soon as you get that out of your life and believe and confess, then I'll come in. Our lesson Wednesday night, Sally just gave a, uh, we had 15 kids Wednesday night. We had, um, how, many, how many horse barn girls did we have, Clara? We, does anybody have one of those brushes that when you come out of the barn, you brush? Does anybody have one of those laying around the house? We have to buy one of those because we have all these girls. It's awesome. They come here straight from the barn on, on Wednesday nights. And I just think it'd be good. It'd make them feel more comfortable. And it'll be a lot easier on Nancy cleaning mud and other things off the carpet. But, but Sally just laid it out a simply thing. Confess and believe. But see, in the church today and in, in, the, in the time of Paul, it was confess, believe, and 
be circumcised. Confess, believe, and do this. Confess, believe, and stop doing this. Salvation is based on Christ alone. If you add anything to Christ or take anything away from Christ, it is no longer the gospel. It is just, it may as well be abracadabra. It may as well be, you name, whatever it is. It is Christ and Christ alone. So are you saying that I can be a Christian? I'm saying to be a Christian, you have to confess and believe in Jesus Christ, period. Add anything to it, subtract anything away from it. It's no longer this gospel. And that's what Paul was trying to say to the churches that are in Galatia. So we're going we're gonna to begin in chapter uh, 2, verse 1. And um, Okay, great. Whew. I was worried there for a minute that I had messed up and had this all in the book of Acts, which a lot of it is in the book of Acts. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. Now, <clears throat> we're going to spend just a few minutes here because it's pretty important. Paul, Paul is a great communicator. Paul is a professional student. Remember what we said last week, that Paul was one of those guys that his teacher made note of him. I mean, it's a historical fact that Paul was one of those guys, you couldn't give him enough homework. You couldn't give him enough reading. He was just, he was just a voracious learner and reader. He was a smart dude. And so, when Paul says something, there probably is a reason behind him saying it. he's not like me and he just says something to be talking sometimes. He actually has a real, real point here. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. First of all, so after at least 12 years, he's going back to Jerusalem. Well, is this the first time he's been to Jerusalem in 12 years? No. He's going back to Jerusalem for something that has to do directly with the reason that he is talking to the people in Galatia. He said, okay, there was a time that I went to Jerusalem, and I've already addressed this. I remember the time that I went back to Jerusalem, and I met with the Jerusalem Council is what it's called, and we find that in the book of Acts, and we'll be there in just a minute. And I, I, this time, um, I went again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. Okay, I took Barnabas with me. Who is Barnabas? I took Titus along also. Why? Is that an afterthought? Is it a, does it have a different meaning? Well, let's look at who Paul and Barnabas were. Uh, why did he go back and why did he take these guys? Barnabas. Barnabas is mentioned many times in the book of Acts and appears in a few other New Testament books. His name means son of encouragement or son of rest. He is the guy that makes things better with what he says and what he does. We know that um, Barnabas was one of those. He, he, uh, he was the one who took Paul and went with Paul and, and said, look, guys, I'm going to stand in the, I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for this guy. I've seen what he's done. He, it's a real conversion. You guys can trust him. So Barnabas was that kind of guy. Barnabas, Barnabas is one of those people who sold a piece of property and gave the money to the, to the church because he cared about the church and he cared about the poor. And he, he was, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's another one of those stories. So Barnabas had a great reputation. And we know that with the name son of encouragement or son of rest, he was probably the kind of guy we'd like to have around. When, when he showed up, you just felt better. He could come in, you'd had a rough day, and he would just love on you and he would just encourage you and all this other stuff. That doesn't mean that he was all soft because there are some other times that we see Barnabas was the one who got on to Paul about hey, let's take John Mark with us. I'm not taking him. He deserted us one time, and I, that guy, you can't trust that guy. And Barnabas got into Paul's face and said, dude, you're wrong. You, you, need, to, you need to move on. You need to let that be in the past. And, and we know that it didn't disrupt their, their relationship. It made them go different ways for a part of time, but they came back. So Barnabas, the son of encouragement, um, he's, a, he's a great person. He has... Uh, um, we also know, though, that he almost, or maybe he did, he caved a little bit when, uh, when things got to where, well, let's go back to the kind of being the law and, and kind of doing this and doing this because people are watching. Barnabas fell in for that, too. So he had the please man nature, just like many of us struggle with, um, but he also had the boldness to oppose Paul and, and all this. Now, let's look at Titus. Titus he took also. Titus is a very interesting character. We're going to look at Titus chapter 1, 
verses 4 through 16. We're not going to read all those, but we'll, we'll do those. First of all, Titus' name means nurse. Now, I'm sure that got him picked on quite a bit. I don't know, maybe they had male nurses.